We got part of the way through chapter 5 of John last time, and by the time we were low on time, I could see there was way too much material to try to finish in that session. And so we really did talk uh, about chapter 5, verses 1 through 23. And the smaller part of this uh, chapter is a miracle that Jesus wrought, and the larger part is essentially a monologue of Jesus. It began with something of a dialogue, but then it morphed into a monologue, which goes all the way to the end of the chapter. It began with the healing of a man at the Pool of Bethesda who had been sick for many years and weak and could not move himself very efficiently. Uh, maybe he was arthritic or something, we don't know. His, he could move somewhat, but he couldn't move very well. And he was at a pool that had at least the belief attached to it that from time to time an angel would stir the water of the pool and then whoever was paying attention and got into the water first after the stirring would be healed of whatever his problem was. And that was at least the belief of this man and those who were there at the pool. And yet they had seen the pool stirred many times. And he had always tried to get in, but he was slow. And he was needed help. And so there's always someone who got in the pool before he did. One has to wonder how many times he'd seen this happen and how many healings were, you know, observed through this means. Certainly if, I mean, obviously if that belief prevailed about the pool and if on many occasions the water had stirred and people, someone had been the first in, it would be, well, observable whether that person was healed or not. And if that had not been the case, it seems like the sick people would have given up their hope of that and gone somewhere else. Uh, so it must be that some people were healed there. But this man was not really one who had a lot of hope of being one of them. But he had no better options than to wait and hope for something. And Jesus asked him if he wanted to be well. And the man said that he had not been able to get into the water first when the water was stirred. And Jesus just told him to get up and to take his bedroll and go on home. And the man felt strength in his body for the first time, was able to get up. And he was carrying his bedroll. But of course, the main reason for telling this story is not because it was a healing. There are many healings of Jesus that go unmentioned in the Bible. This one is mentioned particularly because, as we find uh, at the end of verse 9, that day was the Sabbath. And so this precipitated a, 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 a conversation, a, a conflict, really, between Jesus and the Jewish leaders who had very strong scruples about observance of the Sabbath and uh, very strong opinions about what constituted a breach of that law. And carrying a bedroll was one of those things that was a breach. Also healing on the Sabbath. A man who did not have a, a life-threatening condition. That is, it was not a life and death emergency. A, a physician was not allowed to do uh, healings or apply his trade on the Sabbath day. Jesus obviously healed uh, though no one could argue that he'd done any work, he just commanded the man to get up and walk. I mean, talking isn't work. Uh, at least it wasn't for Jesus, and it isn't for preachers. Uh, talking is what they do readily. So how could that be called working? Well, something happened. Something was worked. A healing was worked. Something uh, was accomplished through Jesus' effort, and therefore he was working on the Sabbath as far as they were concerned. Now, when he was confronted about this, he said in verse 17, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him. Because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now, we covered this verse last time, but because of the shortage of time, we didn't say everything that might be said about it. And even tonight we won't because I wanted to cover the rest of the chapter. But I do want to point this out. That it might seem to us not obvious 
that speaking of God as your father would be making yourself equal with God. Isn't it rather uh, commonplace for people to call God their father? The, the Jews generally did not refer to God as their father, at least not in a personal sense. Now, there are a few times in the Old Testament where Isaiah speaks of Israel collectively as God's uh, children or God's son collectively and God as the father of the nation. But it was not heard of for people to speak of God as their personal father. And that's what Jesus had done, my father. He didn't say our father, my father works until now, and I work. And so Jesus was, of course, making some kind of special claim to sonship, but even so, uh, is that really the same thing as making yourself equal with God? I call God my father, but I'm not making myself equal with God. Yet, you see, in the context, what he was saying is, my father doesn't rest on the Sabbath, and therefore I don't rest on the Sabbath. My father works 24-7, and therefore I work 24-7. Now the Jews knew that God doesn't take the Sabbath break off. But what Jesus was saying is that he has the same prerogatives God has. The rabbis already, before Jesus' time, had discussed the issue of whether God keeps his own laws, and notably whether he keeps the Sabbath. And you know, this is one of those things that underscores uh, what I try to get across to Sabbatarians, and Seventh Adventists and such, when we talk about this subject. They consider that the Sabbath is a moral law. Why? Well, because it's in the Ten Commandments. And certainly, all the other commandments in the Decalogue are moral laws. So, they just presume that the Sabbath is a moral law. But they don't really consider carefully enough what constitutes a moral law and what constitutes a ceremonial law. Throughout the book of Exodus and Leviticus, you find intermixed together commands that are moral and commands that are ceremonial, but they're not of the same character. A moral command is one that reflects the nature and character of God himself. God is righteous, and that righteousness consists of certain character traits that could never be violated without violating who he is, like justice, like mercy, like love, like faithfulness. These are things that are part of God's character. He could never be unfaithful. He could never be unjust. He could never really be unloving. Because what? God is love. How can he who is love ever be not himself? God is justice. He's, he's uh, mercy. He is faithfulness. All these things are really descriptions of who God is. Now, God could never change what he is. And therefore, the norm of what righteousness is, which is defined by God's own character, will never change. And therefore, all laws, uh, if they are moral, must reflect the character of God. Now, the reason that murder is wrong is because it's an injustice. It's not because it kills a human being. There are times when killing human beings is a just thing to do. That's why the same law that says thou shalt not murder also says you shall not permit a witch to live or something. There, there are things that the Bible says warrant putting to death a human being. It's not the loss of the human life that makes murder wrong. It's the injustice of it that makes it wrong. That's why Christians are not inconsistent, although we are sometimes accused of being, when we might support capital punishment but oppose abortion. I'm sure you've heard the liberals you know, bring this up. Oh, you, you conservatives, if that's what they want to call us, or you Christians, if that's what they want to call us, they, you are inconsistent. You say you're pro-life when you talk about abortion. But how come you're the ones who want to put criminals to death, and we liberals are the ones who don't believe in doing that? We're the pro-life ones, right? Well, this has nothing to do with pro-life or pro-death. It has to do with pro-justice. It's not so much that we're pro-life. We're pro-justice. Death is sometimes just and sometimes unjust. Killing an innocent party, like a baby in a womb, is unjust. That's murder when you kill someone who's done no crime. Worthy of death, that's murder. Killing a criminal is giving a person the punishment that his crime has warranted. That's justice. So it's not a matter of always being in favor of life or always being in favor of death. It's always been in favor of justice because that's, that's what God is. He's always just. Now, he's also merciful. He's also faithful. And that's why Jesus castigated the Pharisees when he said, you've kept the minor issues. You've paid your tithes a mint and anise and cumin, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, which he listed as justice and mercy 
and faithfulness. Why are those weightier matters? Because they are what God is. They are moral issues because God's character defines morality and justice and goodness. And so laws that embody that are moral laws. A ceremonial law is a law that does not necessarily have its roots in the character of God. But a ceremonial law is something that depicts in a symbolic manner some truth or some reality, as, for example, the animal sacrifices foreshadowed the death of Christ. Or uh, you know, the, the laws concerning clean and unclean foods, they foreshadowed uh, or they illustrated the difference between clean and unclean people, as is very clear in the New Testament usage of that. For example, when, uh, when Paul said, you shall not uh, be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, he's referring back to Deuteronomy, which says you shall not plow with an ox and an ass together in one yoke. Why? Well, an ox is a clean animal, a, a donkey is an unclean animal. And you're not supposed to yoke clean and unclean together. So don't yoke yourself with an unbeliever because you're clean and he's unclean. There's these, these ceremonial laws are not laws that are rooted in morality, but in depicting in a, in a ritual way some spiritual truth. So that if God chose, he could have neglected to give that particular ritual. I mean, he didn't have to give a ritual to depict that truth. So that God didn't have to say, rest on the Sabbath day. He said he wants the Israel to rest on the Sabbath day to commemorate that God rested on the seventh day when he created things. But if God had, in fact, rested on the seventh day and had never told anyone ever to keep the Sabbath, that would not violate his character. There's nothing in him that made it incumbent upon him to, to necessarily say, you have to remember the day I rested. He could as easily say, I want you to rest on the sixth day because that's the day I created man. I want you to remember that. Or I want you to rest on the first day, because that's the day I created light, and that's an important thing. He could have said, I want you to rest. He could have picked any day of the week and given a reason for it. It's, in a sense, therefore, arbitrary. A ritual is something that God chose to depict something, but he didn't have to. Because it's not, uh, it wouldn't violate his character to have done otherwise. And so for God to give a command, thou shalt steal, would violate his character, because stealing is unjust. Murder is unjust. Adultery is unfaithful. These are all characteristics that God is not, and therefore they are immoral. And what about the Sabbath, then? This, this matter that the rabbis argued about, does God keep his own laws? The answer is quite simple. Yes, he keeps the moral laws, because they describe his own character. He can't be other than he is. He, of course, keeps the laws of justice and mercy and faithfulness and those things that describe his own holiness. Does he keep the Sabbath? No, he doesn't. He works every day. That's what Jesus said. The Sabbath, then, is not a moral law. If God can violate it, the rabbis didn't understand that. They thought of the Sabbath as a moral obligation. Therefore, they came up with ways to say that God doesn't break the Sabbath. But the truth of the matter is, and Jesus declares it here, the Father, he does the same work on the Sabbath as he does any other day of the week. He does not keep the Sabbath holy. He did observe a rest on the seventh day one time. But he has not observed a Sabbath on a regular basis afterwards. Therefore, the observance of Sabbath, if God can neglect it in himself, cannot be a moral obligation. Because he could never violate anything that was moral and good and righteous. So Jesus himself here, and in other places, categorizes the Sabbath law as a ceremonial law. He did that on other occasions too, by the way, and so did Paul. Paul did in uh, Colossians 2, 16 and 17. There, Paul said, Colossians 2, 16 and 17, Paul said, don't let anyone therefore judge you concerning what you eat or what you drink. Those would be Jewish ritual dietary restrictions. Or he said, or concerning a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. That would be the holy days, the annual, the monthly, and the weekly holy days. Festivals are annual, new moons are monthly. Sabbaths are weekly. He lists the holy days and the, and the food ordinances. Don't let anyone judge you about any of these things, Paul says, because these were a shadow for the time being. But the substance, the body, is of Christ. Christ is the reality. These things were shadows that foreshadowed him. Don't let anyone act like you have to keep these things, Paul says. What did Paul then liken the Sabbath to? He likened it to food restrictions and festival restrictions. These are clearly ceremonial. These are not moral things.
Likewise, Jesus did the same in Matthew chapter 12 when his disciples were accused of breaking the Sabbath. When they picked the grain and rubbed it in their hands and they were accused of breaking the Sabbath. Jesus did not say that they were not violating the Sabbath. Some people say, well, maybe they were just violating the Pharisees' traditions about the Sabbath. Maybe or maybe not, but that's not the argument Jesus gave. Jesus just took it as a given that they were breaking the Sabbath and said, but haven't you read what David did when he was hungry? How he ate the showbread that wasn't, you know, it was only for the priest and he wasn't a priest, so he violated the showbread law. Jesus is clearly saying that what David did eating the showbread is not much different than what his disciples did in breaking the Sabbath. Did David break a tradition or a law? A law. There was a law of Moses that only the priest would eat the showbread. Was it a moral law or a ceremonial law? Ceremonial. It, it was, it was showbread. It's tabernacle ritual. There's no, I mean, for, again, how do we know if it's ritual or, or moral? If God had said anyone can eat the bread without violating his own character, then, it's, then his restricting it to the Levites isn't a moral issue. If God, in other words, could have given an opposite command on the same subject, and it would not be a violation of his character, then it's, it's a bit arbitrary command of a ritual sort rather than moral. David had broken a ritual law, a ceremonial law, by eating ceremonial food that was supposed to only go to the Levites. And Jesus said his disciples had done something similar. How so? They had really broken a law. Which one? The Sabbath. So that was parallel to David breaking the showbread law. A ceremonial law. See, Jesus and, and Paul always treated the Sabbath as if it was ceremonial. And Jesus did that here too. He says, my father works all the time and I do. Now what he's saying is, you Jews have always known that God works around the clock. You have to know that he does as much work on the Sabbath as he does any other day of the week. And therefore, if he does, I can. Now that's the implication that made himself equal with God. He was not talking about his ontological equality with God in some theological sense. He's just saying, if God has the right to do it, I have the right to do it. Now, obviously, there's things that God has the right to do that you and I don't have the right to do. Now, God has the right to take vengeance. He tells us not to do it. Don't avenge yourself. That's God's part of it. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It's not okay for us to take vengeance. It's okay for him to. He has rights that we don't have. So for me to say, well, if God does it, I can do it, is in a way saying I have sort of an equal status with God, at least if we're talking about something that God alone has the right to do. To the Jewish mind, God had the right to work on the Sabbath, but we don't. And Jesus said, well, I'm not you, I'm more like him. I'm not restricted like you are, I'm under no more restriction than he is. That's placing himself not on a human level, but on a divine level making himself equal with God in terms of his privileges or in terms of his uh, duties or his activities. He, he can do what God can do and what nobody else but God is allowed to do. Because if God works on this episode, so can Jesus. So that's putting himself on God's level, and that's what they were upset about. And so he went on, and we won't go over it in detail. We won't even read it in detail anymore. But verses 19 through 23, the last verses we took last time, he gives this parable of the apprentice son. He says the son doesn't know what, he's, uh, what to do unless his father shows him. But his father does show him. Because the father loves the son and shows him everything he does. And he teaches him how he does it. And the son does it the same way the father does it. He's talking about the normal practice of a man teaching his son the trade. The son doesn't intuitively know how to, how to build tables out of wood. But his father, who's a carpenter, will teach his son. Jesus was no doubt reflecting on his own upbringing. He grew up as an apprentice to a carpenter, and he learned the trade from that carpenter, his father, his legal father, Joseph. So he's saying, that's how it is now with me and God. When I was a boy, I learned my father Joseph's trade. He showed me how to do it. And I don't, when I make tables, I do it just the way he showed me, not a different way. He was a good carpenter. I learned his way to do it. I, fought, I carried out all his trade secrets. The family business was safe in my hands. Because once he died, I could still do, make the same quality of goods he did because I did it his way that he showed me. So now I'm working with my other father, my father in heaven. And now I'm doing his work. And I do it his way. And so this is what Jesus is explaining here. He's not acting as, a, as one who's a rival to God, but one who's 
as it were, appointed by God and authorized by God to do his work the way he does it. And he says this at the end of verse 20. And he will show him greater works. That is, the father shows the son what he does, and the, fa the father's going to show the son greater works that have already happened, that you all may marvel. Now, what are these greater works? I believe they are the works that the Jews believed were God's work alone, and that is raising the dead and judging the world. Jesus, for the next uh, ten verses, essentially, is going to talk about his role as the judge and the one who raises the dead. Now, these are, of course, eschatological phenomena. At the end of the world, the Jews believed, the Pharisees at least did, that God would raise the dead and judge all people. Christians believe that too. But what the, what the Pharisees believed was the work of God, Jesus said, that's what I'm going to do. The Father's given me authority to do those things. Uh, he's turned that business over to his son, too. And I do it the way he shows me. Now, these two things together are going to be the center of attention in the next ten verses. And I just want to point out to you that the raising of the dead and judgment of the lost go together as two sides of a coin. And in Christian theology, according to Hebrews chapter uh, 6, these are some of the foundational truths. Apparently, some of the earliest truths that Christians are expected to learn. Because in the opening verses of Hebrews 6, the writer says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to maturity or perfection, not laying again the foundation. Now, you don't, when you're building a house, you don't keep laying the foundation over and over and over again. You lay the foundation properly one time, and then you go on and build on that foundation. The writer is saying, you people need to go further than just the foundation. So let's stop relaying this foundation over again. Let's go on to maturity and not stick around with the basic principles of Christianity. It's time to go on from the milk to the solid food. That's what he says, of course, in the previous verses at the end of chapter 5. Now he lists what he calls the foundational things, or what he calls the elementary principles of Christ. What are they? There's six things he mentions. Repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Certainly those are foundational. You don't even become a Christian unless you have repentance and faith. That's in fact the way you enter the Christian life is through repentance and faith. That's definitely foundational. And he says also the doctrine of baptisms and the laying on of hands. Well, that's also pretty foundational because as soon as a person became a believer in the New Testament times, they were baptized and had hands laid upon them to receive the Spirit. We see an example of that in Paul's behavior in Acts 19 in the first seven verses. When he meets some people in Ephesus, he baptizes them in water and lays hands on them. That apparently was the initiation rites into the, into the body of Christ for new believers. So these are truly elementary principles. I might add that although they are said to be elementary here, many modern Christians don't have any, any concept of what they are. <laughs> so you know these, these Christians that the writer of Hebrews is writing to are, he complains in chapter 5 that they're, they're like babes. They can only drink milk. They're, they're not ready for solid food. That's what the whole discussion in the, about the five verses previous to chapter 6 are saying. And he says that those who, are, who drink milk are just unskilled in the word of righteousness, and they are babes. And he's actually you know, a bit frustrated with these people that they haven't grown more. And he says, so let's go on from these basic things. But when you look at the things he calls the basic things, modern Christians, including Christians who have been Christians for 40 years, could they explain to you what the doctrine of baptisms and the laying on of hands is? A great number of Christians, I'm afraid, could not. In fact, uh, even what repentance is, is uh, you know, many Christians have hardly heard much about that. And much of what they've heard about faith toward God is strange instead of biblical. There's whole churches that call themselves faith churches and what they call faith isn't the same thing the Bible calls faith. So, I mean, these basic things that the babes in Christ, the immature, the writer assumed they understood these things. Our modern Christians, a great number of them, don't understand even them. But what else is in that list of these foundational things? The resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Now, this would be eschatological things, but not a lot of detail. There's nothing here about tribulation or rapture or antichrist or any of that stuff. 
what there is is the ultimate outcome of things. When a Christian, when a person became a Christian, it wasn't long before they learned as a basic foundational truth, God is going to raise the dead and judge the world. I remember I was teaching at a YWAM based in Honolulu back in the 80s, and I was talking in, in the home with one of the leaders, and he had been a leader of a DTS, which is their entry-level school, and he also had been, he was at that time a leader of another school called the School of Evangelism. So he had come up a bit through the ranks, and he'd been a Christian for many years before he was in YWAM. And I just made some passing reference to the resurrection, you know, the eschatological, I just made something about, you know, when the dead are raised. And he said, what? And I said, you know, the, in the resurrection, you know? And he, and he said, resurrection? I said, yeah, you're kidding me, aren't you? You know, the resurrection of the dead, when Jesus comes back, he says, he says, you mean you're telling me that we're going to, like, rise from the dead? I thought, oh my. <laughs> Here's a person who's been a Christian for years. He was a youth leader in his church before he came into YWAM, and he went through several schools in YWAM, and he wasn't aware that there was a doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, something that's one of the most foundational things. Every Christian in the first century knew it. It's like they knew about baptism or faith. And so... These are the two eschatological things that everyone knew. I don't know how much they knew about Antichrist and how much they knew about tribulation and rapture and those kinds of things, but they knew there's going to be a resurrection of the dead and an eternal judgment. And that's what Jesus, these two things are joined together in Jesus' discussion too. The Jews knew that God could raise the dead and they believed only he could. They knew he would judge and they believed no one but he could. And Jesus now is going to say, but actually... I'm going to do those things. God has actually turned those activities over to his son. That may seem like God's business, but I'm taking over the family business. The father has handed over the family business to the son and shown me how to do it. And so I'll do it right. I'll do it the way my father does. But he says in verse 21, For as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he will. So just like my father is the one who raised the dead, so am I. I will raise the dead. For the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. So not only raising the dead, but judging these two activities. The father raises the dead, and he's given me the right to raise the dead. The father actually isn't going to judge anyone. He's turned that over to me too. Raising the dead and judging people on the last day. That's, uh, he says that's, he's committed all judgment to the son. That all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Yeah, they better if he's going to be their judge. If you don't honor the judge, it's, it's like, uh, I mean, you could just imagine if you're on your way to court one day because you had a traffic ticket or something, you're going to, to challenge the ticket. And you, you're uh, you know, distracted and you, you're reckless and you cut off somebody in traffic and in a really nasty way. And you get to the court, and it turns out he's the guy. He's the judge, <laughs> the guy you cut off. And you're pleading for clemency on your traffic violation, you know? And you get there, and the judge is the guy that you cut off in traffic. You don't want that. That's not a, that's not a scenario you want. If you want a lenient uh, sentence, you better be good to the judge. And he says, the Father has committed all judgment to me, so you better honor me like you honor the Father. He said, he that does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Further, he says, most assuredly I say to you, verse 24, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, that is judgment in the negative sense of condemnation, but has passed from death to life. Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, meaning that God is the possessor of life. He doesn't derive it from some natural source. He is the source and the wellspring of life. He has life in himself. He's the giver of life, of all life. So he's given the Son that prerogative to be able to give life to whoever he wills to, to have life in his, himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment also because he's the Son of Man. Now that because he's the Son of Man is rather interesting. Because earlier, uh, Jesus has made reference to himself as the Son of God, which is why they wanted to kill him. He had, you know, he's the Son of God. That's quite a, a claim. 
Uh, he's making God his father, making himself equal with God. But now he says, okay, I can raise the, uh, the dead because I'm the son of God. And God has given me that prerogative to have life in myself so I can give life to whoever I want to. But I can also judge because I'm the son of man. My ability to raise the dead is due to my being the son of God. My ability to judge is due to my being the son of man. Why? why how, how, what's that connection there? It's interesting that he says God has turned over all judgment to the son. Why? Well, he says here because he's the son of man. There used to be an old uh, Christian tract in the 70s uh, about the judgment day. And it had uh, all these people waiting in the outer room of God's courtroom on the day of judgment, waiting for their moment in court. And they were all talking about how they, they weren't sure who the judge was going to be, but they knew that he had to be benevolent. He had to, because of all that they had suffered. And they say, you know, you know, he, he shouldn't be able to judge me. I was born in a, you know, a slum. I was raised in, a, in dirt poor and poverty. Another person says, well, you shouldn't be able to judge me because I was, uh, I was just uh, you know, rejected by my family and I was hated by my friends and betrayed by close confidants. And they all had these different things that they had endured. And they said, well, you know, the judge, you know, he can't, he's not really qualified to judge me. I've been through all these things. And they said, the only way he could judge me is if he would come down and, and go through all that. And then when, of course, they were called into the courtroom, they saw... The judge was Jesus, and they, saw, they realized that he had, in fact, uh, qualified, you know, because he was the son of man. God in heaven, of course, has every right to judge whoever he wants to. But it is true that the Father, until the incarnation, the Father could not be said to have really been in our shoes, really experienced temptations as we have. How could he really know firsthand how to judge sin when he's never been tempted to sin himself. The Bible says that we have, uh, and this is over in Hebrews also, we were talking about Hebrews earlier, but it says in Hebrews chapter 4, in verse 15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So, our high priest, which is a little different than judge, but still, Jesus is both. He is not unsympathetic because he has gone through the same testing we've gone through. But he, he passed the tests. So he is qualified. When Jesus said about the woman in adultery, let him that is without sin be the first to cast a stone at her. He's basically saying, who's qualified to condemn her? Who's righteous enough? Who is uncompromised in their own life so that they could judge this woman for her failure? And no one in the crowd, including the oldest, was qualified to do that. And the old crowd kind of faded away. And then Jesus, the only one who's truly qualified, just said to her, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. But it's obvious that what Jesus is saying is, in order to judge sinners, someone has to have had some uh, connection has got to have had some temptation and resisted it successfully. I mean, God could do it without having gone through it. God's, had, God's got the right to unilaterally do whatever he wants to do. But he, he has turned things over to Jesus to judge because Jesus has been here and done that. And, uh, you know, one preacher I heard say, uh, he said he thinks the first thing Jesus said when he went back up to heaven after the ascension was, man, those guys have it harder than we knew because he'd been through it. And uh, the Bible says he learned obedience through things he suffered. He learned what it costs to be obedient to God. He'd never had any problem being obedient to God when he was in heaven before he came to earth. When he came to earth, he had to sweat, as it were, great drops of blood in his struggle against sin. He found out. And he is therefore able to be a merciful and compassionate high priest and a merciful and compassionate judge, at least a knowledgeable judge who knows what we face, so that there's... That's why God has committed all judgment to the Son, because He's the Son of Man. Yeah, He's the Son of God, too, and that gives Him divine privileges, but as the Son of Man, it gives Him human sympathies. Or we might say empathy. 
Okay? Now, verse 28, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice, as Jesus' voice, and come forth. Those who have done good, in Greek it's those who have done the good thing, to the resurrection of life, and those who have done the evil thing, to the resurrection of condemnation. Now, you'll notice the similarity in the words in verse 28 and the words in verse 25. Because in verse 28, he says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming, in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. In verse 25, he said something kind of similar, but not identical. He says, Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Now, in both cases, he talks about dead people hearing his voice. And the result is, they come alive. In both places, he says, the hour is coming. But in one case, he says, and now is. In the other case, he does not. What is this saying? Well, it's clear that in Matthew, uh, I mean Matthew John 5.25, Jesus is speaking about two things. He said, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. So, dead people will live as a result of hearing the voice of Christ. The time is coming when that will be true, and there's a sense in which it's now true also. Well, what, is, what, what does it mean in, in the sense of the hour is coming? What's the future instance of the dead hearing the voice of Christ and coming to life? Well, that's what he tells us in verse 28. The hour is coming. He doesn't say now is. This is the part that the hour is coming. This is the future part. That those who are in the graves will hear his voice. This is a physical resurrection on the last day. And will come forth. So that's the sense in which the, now, the hour is coming, in which the dead hear the voice of the Son of God and live. But what's the now is part? In what sense is it now true that the dead hear the voice of the Son of God and come to life? Well, he's already said that in verse 24. He said, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. He shall not come into judgment. He has passed from death into life. This is not the last day. This is now. This is those who hear my words now. And if they come to life from hear my words, then they have passed from death into life. Of course, spiritually. He's not talking about physically. So he says there's two senses, one now and one later, in which dead people hear my voice and come alive. The part that is now is people who are spiritually dead, they receive the gospel, and they pass from death into life, spiritually. Paul uses that language also in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, you who were dead in trespasses and sins, he has made alive with him. But he's talking about when you're converted, when you're born again. You were dead before in trespasses and sins. Now you've come alive when you were born again. That's what Jesus is talking about here too. You hear my words, you believe in it, then you pass from death into life now, spiritually. You experience the power of the resurrection, the power of the age to come now, personally. But there's another sense in which the hour is coming, in which the dead will hear the voice of the Son of Man and live, and that's the physical resurrection. There's two resurrections, one spiritual that is happening now. There's one physical that is happening later. This explains what is otherwise very difficult to explain in Revelation chapter 20 and verses uh, 5 and 6. This is, of course, the chapter about the millennium, which is the most controversial chapter in the Bible, some have said, because... All theological systems uh, gravitate toward one or another millennial position. This is the only chapter that mentions the millennium. This is the only chapter in the Bible that mentions a thousand year reign. So whatever your millennial position is going to have to be coming from this chapter. And uh, of course many are pre-millennial and believe that the millennium happens after Jesus comes back. That Jesus is going to come back and set up a millennial kingdom on earth. That's the pre-millennial system. In which case, everything that happens in the thousand years is considered to be future, after Jesus comes back. And what we have here in Revelation 20, verses 5 and 6, is, but first of all, in verse 4, he said he saw 
the souls of those who are beheaded for Christ, enthroned and reigning with Christ for the thousand years. But it says in verse 5, the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power.